everybody. How are you doing? Here we are. Episode 5, The Real Internet. This is CSG Flix, the series about building your own streaming service from scratch. Uh, it's mostly been live coded and boy have we got a show for you today. So there is a lot to talk about. I'm going to actually get myself the glove because we're going to do a bit of drawing. Um, since we're going to be covering mostly stuff about the internet, there's going to be probably less code in this episode than a lot of the ones previously because this, this is really about um, kind of how global networks work and to kind of like build a better model for everybody of like, you know, <laughs> what it what it really looks like. I want to go ASMR club. Yes, kid Kev. <laughs> nice. Yes, it, it totally is visual ASMR. But uh, no, sorry, that's uh, that's his patent. So uh, I <laughs> not not stealing it from you, man. Um, very funny last night, by the way. Um, so just to be period specific, I thought, you know, if you're building a streaming service, let's wear the t shirt. So we have I have the hack day shirt on. I've got the coffee cup, we are all swagged up to no end. Uh, so this ought to be interesting. So we're gonna we're gonna basically run through. Um, well, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> so um, why don't we just uh, kind of kick this off and get going? Let's take our app out to the real internet. All right, yeah, that's it. That's episode five. That was from the original uh, first first episode, actually. That was that was the overview. So we are here today. We are doing we are rocking E five. This is all about real, and I'm gonna give it a nice nice quotes here because it's seriously real. Internet. All right. So this is um, we we want to basically kind of go beyond the you know kind of typical like all right i fetch and i do a url and magic happens so i guess that's a magic would be a, <laughs> a top hat and here's our rabbit coming out of it but um so basically this is this is going to be uh kind of fun so th there's we we have a bunch of different topics uh, to sort of go over here. And we're, I'm going to focus mostly on as it pertains to uh, a streaming app. So this is um, CSG Flix. So we're, we're basically, we're worried about the live case. This applies all to regular web apps. Um, it's really, um, the, the, uh, the stuff that I'm covering really is, is generally applicable, but it, it helps to have a little bit of a model about how it works. I don't want to spend too much time on that. I mean, there's, there's tons of like books and <laughs> talks you can go to. So we're, we're, I'm going to try to keep uh, a bunch of that simple, but just sort of like, what are like the key points as pertain to uh, our particular use case? And for that, I'm going to switch over to blue. So we have this sort of browser view of the world and in the browser, we basically just pop a URL and then, you know, our web browser does some stuff. It goes over to the cloud and then some server somewhere says, oh yeah, sure, that's okay. Cool, I'll, uh, I'll send you back that and we're all good to go. This is a nice simplification and it unfortunately doesn't help you very much when you need to diagnose like, why does my web app like, why is it not good? I, I, I don't know what's happening here. I don't know what's happening here. I don't know entirely what's happening here, but it mostly looks like what was in the lab, except in the lab, I mean, everything just kind of worked. I mean, I just had the, the server right here and I had my my browser right here and, and everything worked fine until I got to this thing. Like, and, and once I got here, as I described in the first episode, and there's actually an E in that, this is kind of where most companies break like this is this is the bridge too far <laughs> so um what we're gonna do here is kind of understand a little bit about like wh what is in this cloud and really it's actually just composed of a lot of computers just sort of like your browser computer and they're really low end they're they're these well actually we already use that color let's 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 be done there so they all kind of like connect to each other 
And typically these are just, you can think of these servers, they're really just low end computers most of the time, like especially on like, um, you know, the, the kind that you're gonna have for your Wi-Fi or, you know, whatever. Um, and the key thing about all of these computers is that they have two interfaces. So this might connect over like, you know, some long copper wire, you know, going back to your house. Um, and it might connect to another one of these computers over some fast ethernet, and then that one's connected to this one, but that one happens to have three interfaces, so it's also connected to this one. And really, the way that your message eventually gets through to your server is by passing across these interfaces. So I basically take my request, you know, which let's just say this is a get, and it comes down here, it sort of, it says, all right, is that local to my local network? Well, no, not by the time I'm getting to like a real server. So it goes, well, I have a path out, you know, to another interface, so I'm gonna kind of go along there. And then it asks this computer, all right, do you know which way this this server is? Like, like where where is this, you know? Well, I don't know, but I know that he knows. And then, actually, I don't know why these have a he gender, but uh, it knows. And then this this particular device says, okay, I'm connected to a couple people here. So I, I know that that one is closer than going over this one. This one might be connected to, but that's not a great path. I think, I think you're better off kind of going that way. And then this one says, okay, that's fine. I'm just gonna kind of head all the way over here. All of these are referred to as hops. So we're basically kind of, jumping through the network from, you know, and this might be in my diagram here, I've got one, well, depend, you don't you don't usually count where your starting point is a hop, but I've got one to the home router, two, three, four, five. Now, on a typical internet route, we're, we're probably looking for somewhere around like 10 to 30 hops. This is kind of rough. <laughs> it, this is gonna be a bad connectivity situation, and this is gonna be pretty good. So um, a lot of lag is usually related to how many of these hops, but it really also has to do with like how busy some of these links are. Like, like this particular link might be super busy. And that means that a lot of traffic is gonna kind of get like stopped here and you know, it'll eventually make it over here, but you can kind of think of this like flowing water. Like if you try to pour too much water through a small, hose then it, it just it doesn't go faster <laughs> at some point so this is this is kind of this is this is i'm just gonna hand wave some of this but these are typically called buffers and these buffers they sometimes get really big and that's that general problem is kind of referred to as buffer bloat but we'll we'll that's that's a little more than i want to get into today so we're not going to worry too much about this what we are going to worry about is that each of these hops so like i've got hop one two three four and eventually my server, each of these hops is in a place. Like it, we, we, we don't think about it because all of this happens so quickly. Like, you know, typically from end to end, we might, even if we're traveling a go, across a good part of the world, that might be like 200 milliseconds for each of these to travel. Now, that seems like a lot to a gamer who's probably gonna prefer things to be more like, you know, 10 milliseconds, but, you know, because every bit of like delay, you know, might might affect your next shot <laughs> or whatever kind of game you're playing. But um, this is kind of amazing for anywhere that I might be to anywhere where the server might be. Now, obviously having the server closer to the user is gonna be better. And we're gonna get into that a little bit later, but um, this is basically a very simple model of sort of how it happens. So when this response comes back, it's typically like a larger response. And, you know, this might be on the order of like, you know, a few K on up to a few megs, up on up to like gigs if I'm downloading a big file. But moral of the story is that we don't really know exactly what the scale of this is gonna be. It depends really on what sort of traffic we're, we're dealing with. And all of these devices along the way, they need kind of more manageable chunks to work with. So those this message gets divvied up and this is the packet view of the world. We, we, we call those like a bunch of different packets. So here we got packet one, two, three, four, on. Um, however many packets can be sent that are needed. So you can kind of think of this, this is more like if I imagine this as kind of a envelope model of the internet. And each one of the messages, I can't put, you know, for one stamp, 
I can't put too much into one envelope, but if I want to send a bunch, I can I can send a bunch of different ones. Or if it's something bigger, then it might travel slower. So that that's not really the the way the internet works. So we're we're not going to worry about that type that scenario. We're going to assume that every message, because it's typically just bits, ones and zeros, we can we can go and break it up. It's subdividable into these little chunks and these little packet chunks. They can travel around and sometimes they get lost. Some like maybe a bunch of these come back on then until we get to packet four, which happens to, you know, just get sidetracked and, you know, it goes and has a beer. And that's that's unfortunate because that means that uh, packet four is where are you? Where are you packet four? I, I, I don't know where packet four went. <laughs> so we, we want to worry about that as well. That's going to that's this is typically referred to as loss and. It's, it's a little bit manufactured because we don't actually know if packet four is just working its way around a non-optimal path and it's just taking too long or if it really just went out for happy hour. So that that part, we, we're never really going to know, but we just sort of like intuitively refer to this whole idea as loss. So we're going to we're going to try in that case, we're going to retransmit and we're going to say, hey, I lost four. And then, you know, this is going to go. Here's four duplicate, <laughs> um, which is really going to be like packet 20 or however far ahead we got. So that's in a nutshell, that's how reliability works in TCP. I don't want to go too much into the actual protocol specifics because the important part for us today is going to be these servers and, you know, they're, well, they're routers, but they're really... Uh, <laughs> generally low-end computers, some of the ones towards the center of the internet tend to be really, really fast and really, really high performance. But the stuff that's out at the edges tends to just be like a really basic computer that says, okay, I've got something here and I need to send it out over here. All right, great. That's in a nutshell, you know, how the internet works. So when we start studying it, we can kind of say like, what path did all of this go? And the way that's typically done is by a starvation technique. <laughs> so the way the way we do that, and this for those of you familiar with trace route, this is this is the gist of kind of how it works. It basically says, okay, I want to send to here. Now there's no direct link between the two, so it's going to need to go here, 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 here. And what it does along the way is it says, okay, send to this, except only go through one hop. And so then it goes here and then it basically, this says, oh, too bad because and that's, uh, I can write better than that. So too bad comes back and says, yeah, it's not one hop. But when I find that answer, I know who this is now. And if I send out and I say, okay, let's go two hops, then this is going to come back, it's going to get to here, and then this one's going to reply, too bad, and send it back. And now I know who this one is. And if I keep doing that all the way until I get to the final destination, you know, here, cool, then I can actually kind of smoke out who all of these different routers are along the way. And if I go and I take a quick guess based on, you know, their IP address, I can say like, where are you, you know? And I can, I can geolocate them and I can build a rough map, um, depending on how good I know where this particular IP is located in the world. And if I put that all together into a visualization, which I'm going to show you shortly, then I can build some pretty cool looking, and that's what I refer to as the spy maps, because they, they look very much like <laughs> one of those spy movies when, you know, a message is like, oh, they got our link. They got us in, in Delhi. No, no, no. They've, they've caught us in the Caymans, you know, and you can always see like those lines going across the globe. Like that's, we're going to try to build something like that. Okay. So. That's neat if I know where the IP is located. So I have a big master table. Oh, and sorry, I skipped over something. How do I know who all of these things are? Well, I need an address, and that's the same as your normal notion of an address. Like, okay, if I'm if I'm living here and I'm in Reading, Connecticut, and you know, I'm at this house and you know, whatever, like 
that's that's a good place to be. Now, this is more like a phone number in terms of it. It's like it's like you're number one, you're number two, you're number three. Except we want to sort of break these up so that we know which the, these 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 blocks are sort of owned by these routers. So if I have something like you know, let's say that like this is one dot and I'm I'm using IP four here um, on purpose because all these concepts are gonna translate later to IPv6, but this, except this this is gonna be a much, much bigger address space. We sort of learned that the internet was gonna be very popular. <laughs> so, great, I can take this particular address. Now, this the, the net block usually starts with a zero. So I can take this particular address and I can say, this is the first one in that block. So this is really 1.0.0.1. All right, and this might be 2.0.0.1. And if I have a master table, which sort of says like, all right, you know, what's the IP and where is it? Then I can start to build this type of spy maps. I can say 1.0.0.1 is in New York City. All right, and 2.0.0.1 dot one is in Chicago. And as long as I have a very complete list, then it becomes not too hard to put these onto a map. So for today, we're gonna to be kind of borrowing a few lists that are available. Um, and I'll, I'll cover some of that a little bit later. We're, we're, that's, that's, that's the fun part. <laughs> okay, so how do we know which of these blocks is in which place? Well. These routers, they're in collections. So when I have a particular collection, and we're gonna we're gonna say router collections are more of this brown. So um, mostly because I'm thinking about coffee right now. This one, this one, and this one are all covered by one set of network people. But this one, this one, and this one. So this might be like you know. In the, in the New York example, maybe this is Verizon, or, you know, and Verizon might be hooked up to say Comcast, or, you know, maybe, maybe Amazon, which we're gonna get to a little bit later, is, you know, another collection. And so all of these, they sort of manage themselves um, within this organization. So AWS says, okay, we handle these ones. Verizon says, okay, we handle these ones. And Comcast says, we handle these ones. What do you call a collection of routers? This is our collective noun. So, you know, if you have a bunch of geese, you have a gaggle of geese. If you have a bunch of crows, you have a murder of crows. Well, what do you call a bunch of routers? An ASN of routers. And that is really just kind of, you can think of this as just sort of a grouping of a particular set. So this might be ASN1, it's not for Verizon, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. And this might be ASN2, and this might be ASN3. And they kind of agree to exchange routing information with each other at various points. Now I'm not gonna go into that protocol, but typically that's done over a protocol called BGP. And that's important for when we want to say who owns a particular IP block. So if we say something like 1.0.0.0 and a bunch of addresses from there, which I'm just going to use the, the shorthand to that, um, and 2.0.0.0 and a bunch from there, this might be owned by ASN1 and this one might be owned by ASN2. and by the way, I'm using the word owned very loosely here because they're actually just leased from, well, I mean, no one really owns the block. It's more like it's registered to a particular <laughs> company, but um, I'll just use the term owned a lot. Anyway, so, and they exchange routing information and then basically using that routing information, when I go and, I, and I'm here on my browser and I want to connect to some server somewhere, That's pretty much how these all know where the different blocks are. Like, well, I know that I can get all the way, I need to get to this, I need to get to ASN, oops. I need to get to ASN four, which is where that server is. So the way you can get to four is you can go through one, 
So two, four, you can go through one, two, 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 three, to four. Or I can go from across, so that would be kind of going this way. Otherwise, I could also go from one to three to four, which would be a nice shorter path if it's available. Um, in the event that there's like a link issue, maybe I have like network five, you know, so if this is ASN five, maybe I can come, let's say that there's an outage over here, then maybe I could go this way through five and then over to four. So I could go one, two, five, four. And I wanna to try to choose the path that's shortest. So I could choose it shortest based on this. Sometimes I might choose different ones like depending on reliability or depending on load. Like th these are sort of changing all day. You know, like th this this might experience a really high volume at, at, at evening with like more cell usage. This might experience a really high volume at evening with streaming service. This one experiences high volume all day. So these paths are sort of like always changing. All right, great. That's enough about <laughs> kind of the, the theory of that. So what what we're gonna do here is like, I, I really wanna take a look at how this stuff is really built. I wanna get away from these sort of theoretical numbers. So I'm gonna remove the ASMR glove that Kid Keb mentioned. And hello, Miss Sagittarius, how are you? And let's go, let's go to our practical stuff and and start actually getting into this. All right, so let's take Hello, how's everybody doing? I'm I'm here. I've got my uh, oh, and that's my window wants to be a little bit bigger. All right, so we have our CSG flicks and we have our globe, um, and lurking is totally fine. Don't <laughs> you lurk away, Miss Sagittarius? Uh, we have our globe here, and uh, it seems to be running locally. And by the way, there's a few conventions that I sort of skipped over. Obviously, there's no place like 127.0.0.1 which is home. So that's just always a way of referring to yourself. But in, and, and routers kind of know that. They say, oh, you know what? That's, that's not something I should send out on the internet. So this particular app happens to be running on my computer, but we're gonna, we're gonna get to that in a moment because that's, that's something that we're gonna be able to, to see. So how do we find our way from where I am right now using that trick of sort of like starving the route and saying like, okay, only go through one hop, only go through two hops, only go through three hops and get the error message back and say, all right, what what hops were there in the middle? Well, there's some very nice tools that do that. The, the most commonly, like the biggest, widest, oldest ranged one is called trace route. And I can actually trace route just about anything. I could say, all right, what's the route to, you know, let's say I'm going to Google. And I don't even have trace route on here because I don't like to use it because I prefer Matt's trace route, which is a lot more fun and also works a little bit more quicker. So this is using that starvation technique. So it's showing hop one here. This is open WRT. This is my router downstairs. Um, then it's going out and they're using a 10 address on uh, <laughs> on cable vision optimum and there then that hooks over to something called light path and then we go this is still on the optimum online network and then we're bouncing through these a little bit and we don't really know where they are but we do know and this by the way this is showing the times across all of these different things and we can see some of these numbers are sort of impossible because if this is the time it takes to get to each one of these hosts, and I'm just gonna stop this because we don't, we don't need to keep updating like that, which is a nice feature of MTR. Um, some of these are impossible because this is telling me like from here where I am, you know, which would be hop zero, I guess, um, to the other end is 14 milliseconds on average, right? The last one was 12 milliseconds. But sometimes these ones in the middle, they take a longer time. How does this take 15 milliseconds to the seventh hop when it gets all the way to the other end in 12 milliseconds? I mean, so these numbers are a little bit funny. And that partially has to do with the way that this traffic gets massaged on the internet. But what you will see is sometimes you'll see really big jumps. So in our case, I want to trace out to a server we're gonna be using a little bit later that's over at AWS. Now, it's not answering to pings, so it's not gonna come back at the other end, but you'll notice that there's a few big jumps, and those pretty much correspond to where we're 
going across a lot of physical distance. This this sort of hits, you know, and network engineers will refer to this as sort of something related to the speed of light, because at some point you can't travel, this, this particular server happens to be on the West Coast, so you can't travel from the East Coast to the West Coast in an instant. I mean, it's, well, at least we haven't figured out how to do it yet, but um, Star Trek has. So, but in the middle, you might get a little bit of noise. So don't, don't believe these numbers too specifically, but they're, they're sort of generally right, except when you see this type of jump. And now this is a host that's not telling us something because we didn't get a reply from it, but we did get a reply from the one after it. So MTR is smart and it knows, okay, there's a host here, it's just not answering us. <laughs> this, this is the other end. And obviously between here and here, we cross the country. I mean, we can tell that just on the speed of sort of the transit. So um, this happens, most most of these routers tend to use airport codes. Uh, so that's not exactly right, it's SJC for San Jose, but that's that router is almost definitely located in San Jose based on its name. Um, and that's, you know, managing these large networks, these large ASNs of routers uh, is, is a bit of work and you'll occasionally lose them. <laughs> so a lot of them have some sort of geographic hint like this one also, SJO, San Jose. Um, that's fun because they both correspond to the right sorts of times too. So I can see that this, these times pretty much map up with, you know, where it's probably going across. And, and this NYK is probably a reference to New York. I'm going to guess this is probably white plains. Uh, but again, that's a little bit of guesswork involved there. Now this, this one is called router eight. So I don't know why we're using eight, not seven, but <laughs> that's, that's up to that particular autonomous system. And this is, this would be on the cable vision network. So these are all definitely on the same network. This one is might be a transit network and that's how we're getting across the country. So that might be sort of like that ASN I showed in the middle. And these are pro almost definitely in San Jose and the times pretty much match up with that. Well, wouldn't it be fun if we could kind of see where that is? So um, I, I, I will show you that in a second, but before I do, I do want to show you that this map is actually interactive and it is something that you, who came today get to play with. I, I was working hard for you for this, for this episode. So unreleased to anyone else other than the people here, I would like to share with you this link. So don't everybody hit it at once. <laughs> and if you're concerned about your IP address possibly being revealed, it might show up in a blank. But um, generally speaking, this is a server I set up for today. And it's important, and I think that link didn't get it right, but it's really important that we hit it on port 30,000. So that colon 30,000 had better be in the link. Uh, I did not, I intentionally did not want this to be easily found by people uh, just sort of scanning around on the internet. So you might have to manually copy that link instead of just clicking it. So I'm sorry about that. But um, I know someone in chat is dying. Oh, look at that. Somebody in over in the UK just hit this link and look, it turned. My hands were not there. <laughs> so um, that's sort of the fun thing. Uh, I, I did this in three and this globe, for those of you who checked in with the map session last Friday, that was the 2D version. This is way more fun in 3D. So hello, Pipes. I'm guessing Pipes is probably the one who actually hit this link based on where I think that person is. But um, yeah, hitting this link will actually cause this thing to spin. Uh, just in case, you know, and I added some country codes in here too, it tries to target sort of a notion of where the center of that landmass is uh, because I don't have any data that's more specific than that. This is just very, very coarse geographic data. It's not the kind of, this is not marketing data. It's not like the kind of stuff that some large advertising G type companies might have. Oh, look at that. Somebody, it looks like over in Denmark just hit it. It's kind of a fun visualization. So if Sunny was here, I'm sure she would hit it and we would see something over here. You like that nice animation ease? You know, I, I, I'm going to take some coffee. Just appreciate that for a moment. <laughs> so this is really kind of fun. You're, you're not directly hitting my computer here. You're hitting a um, web server that I set up on uh, on Linode, and Linode is, I, I basically have a WebSocket hooked up to here. So that that's 
And he, he asked Miss Sagittarius, I'm very glad that I have some coffee. I, I again went on theme for the mug today. So it's, it's old logo, it's old school, but cheers to everyone. So um, that'll be there, you can play with it. Now, how do we kind of see like what that path is? So we have this sort of trace and it would be really nice if we could do things like put this Norwalk, Connecticut, which is not too far away from me, on the map, and then from there connect to wherever this is, if we know, and then from there draw a line over to White Plains, New York, and then from there still stay in New York, maybe go to New York City if we don't know exactly where. We're not worried about super precision. We don't need to know exactly where the router is. We just kind of want to get a general sense and intuition about how it travels. And and then, of course, it'll sort of traverse the country and go over to San Jose. Well. I went and did that for you. So the first thing you're gonna to need to know in order to do that, and the way that this information works, is it basically takes an IP address like this one. And I built a small little IP to ASN lookup. Um, so this is it looking up Google common 8.8.8.8 .8 DNS address that a lot of people use. Um, and we can see here, and this might be a little bit small, so I'll just blow it up. This is this is the number in normal IPv4 dotted quad notation. This is it. It actually is just a 32-bit number. So this is actually it as a number. Uh, this is the autonomous system. And that's just a collection of routers. So this is in autonomous system 15169. And 15169 is registered to Google. And Google filled out on their registration that they were in the US. And that's actually the information I'm using to target where this happens to go. So, um, and if I did that, this would be like, you know, it, it's, the, this, this server is almost definitely, based on ping time that we did earlier, this is, it's almost definitely in New York, but it, just because I'm, I, I don't have that precise uh, geo-targeting, so it, I'm, I'm just sort of centering it on, on that. And this is the particular block that I just told you about. So this was the, uh, you know, 8.8.8.0 .8 and then this slash 24 tells you how many addresses after that. So that basically says that this last did, this last number, whatever number is there, it's it's in this ASN. And so this particular one is here. So if we did that with something that showed up along the way, like this unlabeled 65.19.121.122, oops, let's do that, then this is actually the default rule. So anytime it doesn't know where it is, it sort of defaults to this George Washington University. And, and that's that's kind of like the default, I don't know where it is, I need to give it a place. And you'll see that on things like, for example, if I looked at the home address 127001, that's gonna, it's not really at George Washington University, but they have the, the default prefix set up right now. So um, that's that's more like a an, an artifact of the data. And hello, Don Ho, how are you? So, um, and that'll be true for other things like ones, uh, some of you might be familiar with 192.168. These types of addresses, they're RFC 1918, they're all about not being assigned. So they're never gonna be assigned to any particular provider. So they'll all just sort of default to this George Washington University address. And that's true for the 10 address. And, you know that again it's they're just artifacts so like this one for example is an unassigned address so that's not publicly routable on the internet so okay um yeah doing good just just getting warmed up we're getting in the network session don ho so this is um so basically this this table and if you're interested in this um i put how to do it on my blog so if you go to blogasomeguy.com and I don't have a lot of stuff here, but this is kind of a bit about what we're talking about today. And this 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 article will walk you through how to actually build the table that I'm using. So I'm using exactly this IP ASN map um, in this piece of software. So this is our course rough geolocation. I figure if we don't know where a particular IP address is, then we could at least target it to the country based on what's registered for the ASN that it's in. And that, that'll that be r very coarse precision, uh, but you know, it's kind of fun. Like if I did like 1.2.3.4, uh, that's not assigned here. Let's do, a, let's do a level three address. So 
4.4.4.4 is from level three. So at least I can look on this, see that it's ASN 3356, and that's in the US probably, although level three is a global provider. Okay, um, although it's owned by someone, I think they <laughs> changed that a few years ago. Anyway, um, great, well, that's fun. This I'll leave this up uh, for anyone who wants to play with it, including Don Ho, who, who just got here. Um, so great. If we use that information and we get a little bit more precise, you know, by, you know, maybe reading some of these and saying, oh, this is really in White Plains or this is really Norwalk, Connecticut. And if we actually had, if we built up a longer term database and used a higher quality data set, we could actually start building maps of all of these paths. And that's what I did. So this is your CIA view that I that I mentioned. You're gonna get some spy stuff today. Well, here's your spy map. So some of these are, what I did was I took the people who were hitting this website, you know, it's mostly probably scanners. <laughs> um, this was from uh, the coding with, actually, no, this is from coding with some guy. So there's actually a bunch of legitimate hits here. So this is just people that go and hit codingwithsomeguy.com. I took some of that traffic and pumped it into some higher quality data, which got down to more of the, the city level and built these map visualizations of how it was traveling through the internet to get to all of them. And some of them are really crazy. So you can start off here. This one is looks like it's in Taiwan. Um, and before it goes straight from, you know, this is, they're all gonna start from Linode. So this is all from the point of view of the Linode server that's hosting um, that website. Linode's not directly connected to Taiwan, at least by the path that this chose. So instead it probably went out to Chicago, bounced down here, bounced back up here, and then went far. <laughs> so some sort of cable. Now this is a very unsophisticated mapping technique. I just drew lines between the locations. In reality, this almost definitely went over the Pacific instead of probably the way that it looks like it's going here. But So there's imprecision with this, but I thought it was kind of a fun, rough visualization of kind of how much, we do know that there all of these hops exist. Where their particular locations are, it's, you know, it depends on the data quality of how you have your IP location stuff. So sometimes, you know, Linode happened to take a detour here through the UK before it got to this particular server. I don't know why that happened. Um, some of these get really fun. This is, you know, this is your, <laughs> it took, this. these particular sets of packets went across the country and then they sort of came back and then bounced around and then bounced around some more and eventually got to a server over here. So we don't really know exactly which way it's gonna go. It depends on how those those paths go that I described earlier, but it works remarkably well, which is kind of amazing. And sometimes like, I mean, it just gets really into a twist. This I have a feeling is just probably some bad geolocation data about, you know, where the particular routers are stored. But um, yeah, like this one, I'm pretty sure is an artifact of that. I don't think it really traversed the Atlantic that many times, <laughs> but um, some of these are quite fun. Like here, here's some of the ones over in Africa that, that came by and they, they bounced pretty good to a, this was probably a client in South Africa um, that was accessing the website. So anyway, I built this, I thought it was kind of a, a lot more fun to look at something like this, even if it's less precise than it is to look at something like this, you know, so for this particular route. Um, these take a little bit of time to collect, so I'm not gonna show them live. I mean, basically you have to do this trace route, and by the way, I used MTR for these. So you have to do this trace route, and then for each one of these addresses, you have to go and look them up like basically say, what's the geolocation of this IP? What's the geolocation of this IP? And I'm showing it to you in name form, but if I put it into the form that I was using, then this is kind of more of what it looks like. You know, I, I, So I can get these IPs and look them up one at a time, and I'll end up building a map if I throw it all onto a map. All right, well, that's kind of neat. So you get the 2D and you get the 3D. You know? So. I think the stretch goal, maybe in a future stream uh, for fun, is we might put those on the globe. Oh, it looks like somebody in America hit the globe while I was looking away. <laughs> All right, great. So that's kind of how the internet travels. It's all these routers connected to each other. It's it's constantly communicating paths across ASNs, collections of routers, and 
the path that it takes, I don't really know. I mean, like if I'm going to like Amazon.com, for example, and that's kind of the wonder of the internet is that I don't really need to be concerned too much with how all of this works because it just works most of the time except when it doesn't. Now this one, again, they usually use airport code. So it looks like this one's located in Newark. That sort of matches with the speed of light time calculation. I know that this isn't on the West Coast <laughs> based on you know, how short the time is. Okay, so, well, we can look at traces for a long time. We can get kind of a sense of you know all that. But what we really wanna do is we're building a streaming application. We wanna build a streaming application that works on top of all this. And for you, it might be just a website. It might be uh, for Kid Keb and a visual ASMR. It might be, uh, actually, uh, yeah, he's, he, he has some kind of fun. He was doing some CSS yesterday, so I, I Oh, CSS, you can see my idea of styling. I'm like, ah, just throw it in a tag and <laughs> call it a day. It's, all right, the border won't be quite right. But I just, it's so much work to get that stuff right. And Tyler, if you're around, uh, you're, you're amazing at what you do. Uh, so, all right, what we're typically gonna get in an application is we're probably gonna be pretty far from our particular server. And that'll be far depending on where the user is. Like, so for example, if this user in Brazil is trying to get to the server, it, this is a pretty far path in terms of traversing networks. Now, even, even with the imprecision, even if this is relatively straight line, just the number of hops that this has to go through before it actually hits this particular server, which actually I know is located over here, this is gonna be a little bit rough. And that's typical of your application servers. So wherever you're doing your application logic, like you know, in CSG Flicks, I had the player, um, sorry, the, the, the UI in the previous episode, where we were using a controller and we were sort of L running, we were doing our search traffic. And the search queries, every time I would run a search query by typing another letter, it would have to travel all this path and then get all the way back. And then when the user finally selected a video, it would still have to do all of this, and this would get really bad really quickly. So basically the answer was people came up with CDNs and they said, why don't we create a bunch of servers that don't really have much logic on them? So you don't put your code there so much as you put just your static files. So in the case of our video, we might put our video files on the CDN much closer to where our user is and put our application logic on a server which is further away. And that's part of the problem with using a lot of the existing bandwidth tools. They assume that those distances are the same, but in reality, CDNs are typically very close to the user and application servers are typically far from the user. So that's what we have to kind of engineer around and that's a lot easier if you can see it. And it, it's really amazing every time I've seen with a developer, they're like, well, I'll just go to Brazil and program there. If you can swing that, that's that's a valid solution. You will experience the network exactly as it is if you go everywhere in the world. And I think that's super cool. But assuming you don't do that, <laughs> or that's cost prohibitive, then we might want to be able to teleport and simulate it and have some level of precision around this difference between CDN and AWS. We want to know that whatever we simulate, it more or less matches reality. And that I'm going to show you shortly because I got something that's going to help you with that. But um, so kind of where we left that uh, was I, I had the, uh, and this was, uh, this is pretty much, I had a few check-ins um, that I thought were not very interesting for the stream, but uh, they, the, these check-ins were really about uh, just just kind of cleaning some stuff up um, with the uh, with with the code and and separating I wanted to get ready for CDN use so in the previous episodes I had I just assumed that the CDN server and the app logic server were the same so I just teased them apart and I checked all that in for you on github so if you go to github coding with some guy in the event that you want to follow along in a little more detail uh, later on probably then um, you can find this on the latest version of CSG Flicks. And here's kind of the cleanups that I mostly got in yesterday for 
for today. And and I added a controller last last time we had the controller and we were doing stop and I was like, oh, we need to add some controls for that. But um, this was really about separating the CDN from the app logic server. So uh, I'm not going to go too much over those changes. They're available here. If you want to see that, you can, you can check it out uh, over there. So great. This is the code that I have. It's This is basically up to date. So if I ran this thing, and this is kind of where I got it started. Now I'm running something on this particular port right now, which is this geo simulation. But uh, let uh, I think I added, yeah, I did. I added a command line argument for that, which is what we're going to use right now. So let's put it on another port. Let's let's go on port 8000. All right, so this thing on port 8000, this is sort of where we left it. Now, this was with AWS and the CDN on the same server, which is unrealistic once we go <laughs> out to the wild <laughs> and that's that's I'm gonna show you that um, so here was sort of our LRUD navigation and when we were doing our coffee look how nice and fast and instant it's so beautiful when you do this stuff in the lab you know because it just it just immediately loads like there's no problem you see like I type a search query it immediately comes back and if I go into this you know and by the way minor change here I added um, uh, this is the normal video player scaling with some scaling, which we'll get to in a little bit. But um, this is the the actual size. This is the one that you saw in the previous, and this is the delta. So this is showing the difference between each frame in my video. So, but that's all. You can watch the earlier episodes if you want to know about that. Um, so if I go and I play, and I added a focus. So. And because we're doing video encoding, I thought. All right. So I can see this happening. The, these two are pretty much going to be identical or they should be identical. And this is the delta. This is showing the pixels that are changing from frame to frame. So there's me drinking the coffee from uh, one of the earlier episodes. And this, actually, this is the run length and coding. So this is the compression episode. OK, and we added a stop button, so we can actually stop the thing. Great. Well, everything works fine. Ship the product. It's going to work exactly like that when we hook it up to the real internet. Who thinks that's going to be the case? <laughs> so, should should I ask for a poll? <laughs> does does anyone think the real internet's going to look anything like what I just showed you after showing you all of these different maps of how it's going to traverse the world? Like, no way. I'm going to tell you right now, no way. The real internet doesn't look anything like this. And that's unfortunate because when I programmed it, I was programming it here, and so I don't see a lot of the issues that my users are going to experience the minute that I set this thing up. So I can run around and try to do this like kind of the old-fashioned way, and like plug in on my sister's network and plug in on you know my friend's network and hook it up to my cell phone and see how it works there. But really, I can only test a very small sample of the world kind of going that way, and that's 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 where we run into trouble. It'd be really nice if once we deploy this application let's say to a server we call AWS <laughs> and I don't have ICMP on for it but um, I can actually see what this is like on the real internet now in this particular server setup I have separated the CDN which I'm going to use Linode as my CDN from AWS which is where my application logic is so I think this is a pretty typical setup you might be using uh, Cloudflare, you, if you're at Netflix, you're definitely using OpenConnect, which is fantastic. Um, so your CDN, it, 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 I'm not going to get into like judging the quality of CDNs or how many servers they have or how much you want to spend on CDN stuff, but the CDN itself is pretty much just static assets. So in this case, I've loaded the video files and these images onto the CDN. And I have, not, not when I'm in dev mode like I am on this particular <laughs> server, but I added this um, config flag up top, uh, which I can show you in, uh, let's see, this is in the player, in main. So I added this conf config flag right here, which is uh, where to find your CDN. Um, so this takes a URL. Uh, now, right now, it's I had it set up. It defaults to the local case because I'm assuming you want to run it on your own machine. But if you were deploying it, you would change this URL to be, you know, what your real CDN URL is. And we're going to use, and I look like I have a path issue with that too. <laughs> but um, 
which still loads, fortunately. <laughs> so uh, in our case, we're going to move that over to a server which we call CDN. So it's that way I can say, all right, let's 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 go look at the CDN server. And if we were just loading that page, nothing is here in the default page. I just put empty. All right. And this, and it's important that I keep adding that HTTP colon slash slash, otherwise it'll turn it into a, a search. <laughs> Omnibar fun. Um, so I guess you're supposed to use cdn.local, but anyway, I didn't. So this uh, this particular, it has exactly the same file structure. So if I look in uh, the static, this is the result of the encoding. Uh, so when you run the encoding example that I included, then it creates this directory CDN, including I just tarred this, this directory up and copied it straight to the CDN. So if I go and I look in here, I'm going to see this box art and movie directory. I'll just pull up a piece of box art. So take like this movie. So if we do this and we do box art and we do this particular movie. All right. Well, not the most engaging box art that I've ever made. Yeah, see, that's what happens when you don't put the HTTP colon slash slash every term. <sighs> All right, so if we do this, okay, so here's a slightly more interesting box art. But anyway, so this these assets, basically I just took this directory and copied it to the CDN. So that's what I'm going to use with AWS. And I copied the application to AWS. So if I go to the server called AWS, handy that I did that, and I put it on port 9090, then here's my same application that I was running locally. So in this case, I'm going to, this is, this is the application running locally, but now we're actually, we've deployed it, right? It's running on a server that's somewhere, although now I know how to know where it is. I can say, show me where the AWS server is, and it'll tell me it's going to go through this whole path to San Jose, as opposed to the path to the CDN server, which is going to be a little bit closer. And you'll notice from the times that it is actually much closer. The other one was on the order of 80 milliseconds. So even though it's fewer hops, it's further away physically, and that leads to more transit delays. But this one, a few more hops from my particular network to Linode, but only 33 milliseconds away-ish. So all right, great. Does this work? Yes. Well, it turns out if I oh see, it's not not quite as fast anymore. Now it's there's a little bit of load we can start to see as we go into our application. And if I come in here and I hit play, oh, what what is it doing? I wonder what it's doing. That's not how it worked in the lab. I didn't have to wait that long. What was that like five seconds? Like I mean, come on, you know what's what what just happened? Wait, I'm on the real internet now. This is the real internet. This is actually a really fast internet connection. And that's why I built this. So what we're going to do for this is I built a virtual machine for today. And this virtual machine is, let's, let's get rid of this browser here. This virtual machine is hiding right here. And this device, th this is just stock latest Ubuntu 20 whatever. Um, and I installed Chromium on it. And now I can access my website. Except this particular device is routed through this other device. And that's what I'm going to show you today. This, this is a device and it's respawning too fast because that's a problem with the serial port. This is a operating system which is called Mana OS. And this is what is running, this is something I worked on. It's open source um, and it's available now, but I put it on these hardware boxes. Um, and this is this is a one of the uh, ones that I worked on. And again, low-end computer, it's got a couple network interfaces. And that is it's it's a it's a special router because unlike a normal router, this particular router can change what your internet looks like, and it can it can make it look like anywhere in the world. So let's say that I cleared all this out, 
and I wanted to go somewhere in the world. Like, so we're gonna start off easily. Now, I, I told you before that um, we learned a little bit about ASNs and we saw the example, uh, which I'll just show you real quick, of level three. So this is ASN 3356. So I can come over here and take a look at ASN 3356. And it'll say, oh yeah, that's level three. Now, funny, I used the same table. <laughs> so um, we're gonna add that network as one of our favorites. Now, when I go and I hit this icon here, and sorry about the UI, I didn't have a lot of time, and Kid Kev knows about my CSS skills, but um, when you go and you hit this, you're gonna see this little map over here. And this is, let me just blow this up a little bit. Uh, this is running on the magic modem. And this is what, network traffic on this ASN looks like throughout the day. So this is at hour zero, all times are in GMT. So this is at hour zero, this is, you know, so then it hits peak and then it kind of comes back down. Um, so what it did is it actually changed my internet to reflect that internet. So when I just set this thing to a particular ASN, and by the way, Go ahead, tell me any ASN you want because I want to see what it looks like. <laughs> uh, and you can just tell me like, and I, this this doesn't look up IPs, we could look that up with the other tool, I need to add that. Um, but we could actually just look up by IP, we could look up by country, show me all of the, a, the ASNs that are registered in the US, there's a lot. <laughs> um, there's level three as ASN one, um, a little bit out of date in some of this data. Um, so we're going to use something that I used a lot uh, while I was testing it. This is this is Comcast 7922. So this is kind of Comcast typical broadband. Uh, looks a little bit different from the level three network, but then this is an end uh, internet provider. And then what? As soon as I click that, it changes my simulation for what these network characteristics look like. And let's take that, let's try that out. So we're on Comcast now, and I go and I load, and I remember my HTTP, I go and I load my AWS server. Okay, I didn't, it's not there, it's on for 9090. Okay, this thing loaded pretty fast, and that's not surprising considering the fact that we're testing this thing on Comcast, which is similar to the network, like the cable vision network that I'm on, you know, which is, uh, let's see, I'm not sure exactly which one it is, but um, I could, I guess we could see. Yeah, so let's just take this one and figure out what ASN I'm on. Oh, of course, it's data issue. <laughs> this is on the transit network. This is actually where it is, but um, this one might be registered. So this is why I really need to add that IP lookup to the uh, the other tool. But even if this isn't the exact network, yeah, of course, the data is not there for this. Um, even if it's not this exact network, I know that any of these networks are very similar to the network that I'm on because they all have pretty much the same sorts of characteristics. Okay, this is Telia, so we could use this. This is 1299. This is a transit network again. So we could we could shape to that, and I'm gonna see this is this includes a bunch of data for this particular network. Well, okay, that actually changed my connection. So when I reload this thing, it pretty much looks the same as it did you know, when I loaded it on AWS in my normal browser. So this, um, that wasn't that bad, except now let's, let's have a little bit more fun. Let's see what this looks like if we were in Brazil, like we were earlier. So let's, put, let's pick a provider in Brazil. Um, I don't know, let's see, is there is Claro? No, Claro is not registered under Claro. Um, let's, I don't know, let's, let's take this one. Telecom Limited Limitida. I'm gonna guess, I don't know, I don't speak Portuguese. Um, so we'll try these, the, the ones with the lower ASN numbers, they tend to have been there for a while. Um, so yeah, let's, here's, here's kind of, okay. So this, this one bounces quite a bit. Um, again, network conditions change on time of day. So, but my ping times are quite a bit higher. My packet loss is a bit higher. Uh, and this, by the way, this is the, the ping to, this is the AWS 
Akamai and CDN. Now in this case, I've got uh, Linode loaded as the CDN, but typically at Netflix, this is OpenConnect. Um, and so in this case, like it's very, OpenConnect is very, very close to this particular server. So um, the CDN time will be very fast, but it'll, it will change the settings for the wide area when we go to AWS. So I reload this. Well, there's not much on that page, so it still loads pretty fast until I come and start searching. And yeah, that's not instantaneous anymore. Okay, so now yeah, let's let's get a little bit further. Let's let's I like to go to Uzbekistan. So we're gonna let's try this out. Uzbek Telecom. Now the times are significantly different <laughs> for this particular ISP. And there, that time we actually saw the page load and it, it was a little bit different. And now when I'm doing my search, yeah, that's, even though that probably hit the browser cache, um, we should we should really disable that now that I think about it. So let's let's come in here, let's, let's go into our network and let's make sure that we're, yeah, okay, cache is disabled. So let's reload and, Yeah, that's, we can see that this experience looks different <laughs> than what we just tested. And when I go and I hit play, now this, yeah, I can see it's starting to load the resource here. What's happening? Man, the real internet, different. <laughs> this, this is, not what it was like at all when I was building my application. <laughs> now, again, this is a little bit of an extreme example. I mean, we don't need to go as crazy as this provider in Uzbekistan, but you can see that this, this thing does not load instantaneously. And now we're hitting some packet loss. So the connections actually stalled. Some of those routers in the middle, they weren't happy. Um, and this is a, even though that this resource is loading off the CDN and it knows that the shapes are different. Yeah, that took, that took a while. I mean, that, that did not load immediately. That was 41 seconds to get the asset. That was a blocking download. <laughs> this, is, this is bad, right? I mean, this is, what are we gonna do with this? We're software engineers, how do we deal with this? I mean, we can't just change the network. I mean, we can't, we can't bring everybody fiber tomorrow. I mean, well, that'd be nice. Well, chat, any suggestions? What do you, what do you think we should do? While you're thinking about that, I definitely taken the opportunity to drink some coffee. <laughs> so we want this application to work globally. This is not working great globally. I mean, this, this these are users we're we're not gonna be able to get. I mean, let's let let's take a, a more common like connected example. I mean, Hong Kong, very affluent market. Um Pipes knows all about Hong Kong. And uh let's see, what what which what do we want? HKT? China Mobile in Hong Kong, Chinese University, Hutchinson. We, we've got, everything is here. So HKBN is an all fiber provider. So um, Nick Lai, interesting dude. <laughs> um, so you'll see the times are really, really good. You know, there's very low loss on this network, on this ASN of routers. Um, there's, you know, time to AWS is not super short, but time this one has the cdn on its network so it's super good and we're seeing about 37 megabits so whenever somebody starts telling you about network shaping if there's one thing you're going to take away today realize that just changing the bandwidth is not a very good simulation if you went out there in the field if you set it to like you know five megabits or something but you left all the loss and you don't get into the asymmetry like the real world internet doesn't look anything like that <laughs> so this is, um, and again, if I reload this player, all right, this is going to load. Well, actually, it's I'm not doing anything until play starts. So un until I tap play, um, yeah, that was pretty good, right? That that loaded four seconds. I mean, that's HKBN. If you happen to be lucky enough to be on fiber, um, let's let's pick something in Denmark. Um, wow. Wow, I don't know how to say this, right? Okay, so this is a pretty well-engineered network. We're between 12, 24 milliseconds pretty much all day. Um, 47 megabits, okay, this is a monster of a network actually. <laughs> so maybe Wahoo is 
not it's considering plural site offer oh and hello Fafi how are you plural site is that a no okay. they're not registered under that name um, let's do Telefonica uh, let's let's do something a little more all right Telefonica in Spain yeah these times are not so good so in this particular case open connect is very close Akamai not so close probably not peered on this network um, AWS pretty good and relatively low loss um, there's a few problems in this data pack but all right three and a half megabits this is probably a reasonable connection for um, Western Europe so let's let's try that out hit play and it's be really nice if I could record these sorts of times. Like if I press this button and then I know how long it takes before it starts playing, I can call that tap to play, let's say. Um, that would be a useful metric for my user. And I keep doing it sort of by hand. We're doing it manually uh, by going around the world. But let's actually add that to our application. Let's, let's start collecting real data from our user. Uh, users you know as, as soon as we get this application load you'll notice with some of the packet loss this this stalls occasionally um, and that's you know that's the real world this is what the internet's really doing you know so we, we can already see that this application as we built it is not performing that great um, it's performing it's not performing that great uh, Fafi doing well today uh, I hope you're doing well as well um, just going through some routing we can travel this is the practical teleportation we we can use this interface which is really just hooked up to this um, I'm running it in a VM so you can do it you can do it on hardware you do it in a VM um, and it's changing the shape based on all of these different providers now this is kind of great um, you know, just sort of, it, it works It works fine in software. I built a hardware device mainly because um, it's hard to test this with like a mobile phone or with, a, you know, if you're worried about like mobile performance or if you want to hook it up to a TV or a set-top box or any of the stuff that Netflix had to work on, then that's kind of why I built the hardware version of it. But as you can see here in the virtual machine, you can run it in software. Um, but what it does is all of these shapes and all of this data well i'll get to that a little bit later but um, i'm going to collect it for myself like say i wanted to build my own right here and let's um yeah let's let, let's do that let's add it to the code so in this particular case i'm running i'm, I'm going to work on my local one having issues with my internet <laughs> yeah this is all about the internet do you know any really good monitoring applications to see real-time up and down speeds? Um, I do. Let me get into that a little bit later. Uh, the If you check back earlier, the trace route data is actually the best stuff that you can possibly get. But um, anyway, uh, and also it's easy to check uh, your speed, which, you know, this this shaping right now, it's changed my speed to match the particular provider I chose. So in this case, I was targeting around three megabits and you can see fast.com kind of agrees with me. <laughs> so uh, we can, this will this will eventually kind of settle on, um, you know, around that speed. But if I change that back to say HKBN or Wahoo, which actually had a ton of, I don't even know if I have that much bandwidth here. You can't simulate anything that's faster than what you've got. <laughs> So I went and I changed that. Immediately, you'll notice fast.com changed. Um, so this is this this changes instantaneously in that app, like like packet to packet. <laughs> so um, this, yeah, I can I, we can switch back over to here, and then suddenly fast is going to kind of fall apart. <laughs> it's going to get upset. It's like something impossible just happened. How did your internet become that bad that quickly? <laughs> and Kind of to Fafi's point, you can actually see that in the time of day um, where it shows you like this is how it changes even throughout the day. Like, you know, this particular provider is fairly flat in the sense that it's like from 20 milliseconds. Well, sorry, this was not showing. It wasn't updated. This is the Uzbek Telecom provider. Uh, looks like I got a little graph bug there, um, which which varies between 90 and 135 milliseconds. So this actually bounces quite a bit, packet loss changing through the day. But when I was on HKBN, 
this is all between 60 and 70 milliseconds. So it's this is a really well-engineered provider, comparatively speaking. Um, you could actually look, we could look at yours in here if you want, Fafi, too. So just let me know. Um, this, all right, so let's tune this thing. If we're gonna tune this thing, let's build the metric first. Uh, so I'll build it on, um, yeah, you know what, actually, I think it'd be better if we built, let's just build it directly on the AWS version. Um, because this, if I do it locally, then we're not gonna, I, well, actually, you know what, I take that back. We could, now that we know that this, this simulation kind of works, even if I'm going to AWS, I'm going to, eh, let's stay on AWS, I take it back. It's more fun on AWS. So we're gonna connect ourselves to AWS. Oops, and all right, here it is. Let me um, have this open in another window. So let me just uh, detach that. And here we go. Okay, so it's not loading the video file. This is just the player UI with the tag. So I saw that over here. Um, so this is it passing along like what it, what its tag's gonna be. Um, but you know, and when I load this, you know, I can see, yeah, this immediately loads, that's my UI, but then I go and I make my hit to the CDN and it doesn't actually load anything off here. <laughs> All of that's coming from the CDN. And you do get that asymmetric, like real world simulation with this. So HKBN, again, very nice network. <laughs> so you can see me moving the mouse here, the, the, the cursor in the Delta frame. Managed to catch that one nicely. Um, so let's add some metrics. All right, so we go in here and we edit our main because we're live changing stuff on the server, you know, because we're gonna roll that way. Okay, um, let's, uh, I think, yeah, so this is gonna change our, yeah, let's, let, let's, let's start with the JavaScript first. So I'll load up a template and we're gonna work in the player because we don't, we're not directly concerned with what, how many, like what the ping time is, how many milliseconds there are, like what the bandwidth is. Those are network characteristics, how many hops we're going through. What we really want to know for our application is when the user starts trying to play, how long does it take to play? And that's an application metric, not a network metric. So that's an important distinction because we want to tune the application metrics. We're not, you know, the tools that are here to test all of the different network stuff, they're amazing. but that's, we're not tuning the network, we're tuning an application. So we're gonna have to try to work around how this really works on the internet. Okay, so great. Let's, um, I'll just keep this up over here. So why don't we come down here to our play? And of course my highlighting doesn't work when I jump all the way down because I should not, I should really separate the JavaScript from <laughs> the rest of the file. So um, I left myself a few to-dos, but this, this play kind of captures what we're doing. Um, a, we'll get to a few different code changes that I did, but basically what we want to know is down here at the bottom um, is my actual play button action. And when it does that, it comes up here to fetch and play or if I do it via key, I added the key handlers that we could actually use the dual shock controller we used last time. Um, and when we do that, originally when we wrote the episode, we had hard coded this, but now we were taking, we're taking the movie directly from, um, oh, this, this takes the CDN. So if right now it's hooked up to the real CDN. <laughs> so it's running on Linode, well, the real fake CDN, cause I'm not using Linode CDN. <laughs> um, and this, uh, this URL, it's, it's, it's gonna try to load it there. This is still not the user intent. When it's fetching this URL, actually, no, I, I take that back. From the moment we're in this routine, the user has pressed play. So if we wanna know, measure, like kind of what I was looking at in the console before, where we press play, we initiate the playback, and we wanna see how long it takes before it starts playing, that's really this kind of time right here, which is that fetch URL. And I said we were gonna get more specific than just fetch URL, and that's kind of what <laughs> we're gonna do. So I'm gonna throw this into global space. I'm gonna call this the start time. And let's, uh, let's set start time here to be, you know, and we're gonna use a JavaScript timer for this, just to, you know. We're, 
it, it we're not going to worry so much at the millisecond level as the like second level. I mean, like I'm going to see gross effects here. <laughs> so I'm going to take this start time variable. I'm going to bring it up to here so that we don't have to forward reference it um, because this play function is the next thing that gets called right because if I if I look down here it basically fetches this URL parses the JSON um, which should be pretty fast in native library and then it calls play so in play I actually have a night I know that I have the, the response came back, so I could record like how much is network time versus decode time if I want to get that specific. But let's talk about tap to play as a metric. So I'm talking about tapping that button to the first frame of video shows up. So that's this first image, and this is actually what shows it. So I'm going to take my timing as right after this. So that would be my playback time. So let, let's say that the end time is right here. So let's let's go, and I'll just leave that local. Um, this will be date dot now, and let me just double check that I've got the right. A little rusty on some of this. So if I do date dot now, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna get a number like this, which is um, this is this is an epoch time slid over to add in some milliseconds here. Uh, so I can basically take these two and take the difference of them, and that's sort of my 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 metric. That's my my tap to play. So if I just output that, I can say um, tap to play was really end time minus start time. Okay, so because we're on this server, it doesn't at all reload. Which is unfortunate. So let's get that. Oh yeah, because it's we're editing the JavaScript. <laughs> so all right, so I reload that, I hit play. Hopefully I left it on one of the fast networks. And as soon as that finishes, I get a tap to play. So that was, you know, and again, this is in milliseconds, I believe. So that yeah, 4.3 seconds. Um, if I stop this and just take a look in the network tab. Yeah, that's that's about right. So I can see that there's a little bit extra past the network because it has to do some parsing and then it has to draw it on the screen. So that is my time to my first frame, roughly. I mean, it's at the end of the function call. Let me know if that just doesn't make sense. But basically, that's our tap to play. That's going to be our key metric uh, for tuning the video. Okay, so let's say our tap to play is equal to what I just did, end time minus start time. Okay, so all I really need to do is send that up to the server, and I'm gonna do that, so down here I'm gonna actually, I'll just send, this is after the video is done. I don't wanna kinda get well, it's not because this is all going to be a callback. So this JavaScript will just run straight through to here. But um, one of the things I'm going to want to be careful, I don't want to interfere with a request from the browser, right? So if I'm sending metrics, but um, try to find a good time in your lifecycle to emit your metrics. So let's say that, uh, yeah, let's let's emit. Let's emit um, a metric tap to play. And what did we just calculate we calculate it as TTP okay so of course that doesn't want to work so if I have my emit uh, what do I call it? emit metric um, let's say metric name and uh, value so all we really need to do is well first I'm gonna adjust this. So this is going to be metric name and value. All right, so if I run this real quick, then I should be okay. Yeah, okay, no no, no error so far. Um, and yeah, it comes back and this is going to be what I want to get up to the server. So to do that, let's um, yeah, let's just let's run fetch again. Uh, and let's let's make a new Endpoint. So right now we have a play endpoint. So let's let's make a metric endpoint. 
Now, in a real example, you would probably store this in some sort of data tier. You'd want to do this very quickly um, on your on your metric server. But in our case, I'm just gonna I'm gonna omit it as a log line because we only want to see like from our user. We want to be able to collect telemetry from the user to say this was the experience that they had for a metric we care about. So this is something we care to optimize. So we're just gonna the response will be you know I'll just I'll just say okay um, and what we need to do in here is I'm going to pass this along as a query parameter. So let's say this is metric, and then um, well here let's let's build a little object. So let's say that uh, this is going to be metric name and value. Right now I've only got one metric, but <laughs> got to start somewhere, right? This is our first piece of telemetry on how our application is performing in the field. Um, don't guess, <laughs> measure it. it. Just It's not that hard. You saw how hard it was to measure. I just, uh, end time, start time, that's usually it. There's, there's all sorts of advanced metrics you can get into. Most of it you could do just exactly the way I just described. And it's amazing how few places do just that. You know, they, they, they go and they outsource this. It's like, just, just collect it. You know, it'll take you two seconds. Okay, so this will be our bundle. And in the bundle, we're basically just going to Let's say uh, stringified, and I'm just gonna JSON dot stringify stringify this bundle. Actually, I shouldn't do that. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna URI. Let's encode it. Let's let's do an encode encode URI component because then I could just pass this along as a get parameter. I don't want to get into like cores because I had some cores fun <laughs> getting this far. So I don't, normally you would post this, but for right now, just to simplify it, I'm gonna I'm gonna just send it as a query parameter. Okay, so stringified is gonna be the encode uh, URI component of this bundle. So that'll just be a flat string that's safe to pass along. So I can say the um, we'll say the the query parameter. All right, we'll say the 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 data is um, this stringified thing. And then um, when it's done sending it, we'll just emit, you know, data sent metrics, actually emit metric sent. There you go. Good variable naming, <laughs> good text naming. Okay, so this will return it, and this is assuming that it's the same server. I don't want to get into core stuff. But um, this uh, this will basically just send a request back with that data, uh, which really only has the tap to play in the bundle. So let's um, let's see what comes back. So we're going to say if request, and this by the way, this is just a Flask app. So if I just do request.args and I look for uh, what do we what do we call this D? So let's check if D in request.args. Okay, so if there is data, um, then we're gonna emit it. Now, you would probably store this in like Redis or database, wherever you wanna really persist this. But um, for now, we're just gonna, we're gonna use the log as our persistence. <laughs> so um, metrics data looks like, uh, what do you wanna say? This is uh, request dot args d okay so that should be it so if I go here I won't run it through the simulation you'll get the full speed internet uh, yeah, let's let's go to the one that's remote so it's I have it on 9090 okay and let's go in here I'll just pick the first one and play, then I should have gotten back. Yeah, I get back a metrics object. Uh, looks like I've got an issue there. So let's just take a quick look at what showed up. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was showing you the other window. Let me let me show you the uh, <laughs> the local browser window before we go into the simulated internet version of it. Um, and yes, Fafi, 
uh, Coors is just. I thought about memeing it with the con scream Coors. <laughs> that was that was fun getting that CDN to work. Let me tell you. <laughs> That's, anyway, um, so it looks like uh, JavaScript sending along something I don't want it to send. So let's let, let's just take a quick look here with this and let's cons let's just console.log stringified so this should just be a regular string um, you know what I think yeah if I'm gonna send a full object like I'm doing then I'll need to do both so let's stringify it I think that's probably the bug <laughs> so um, Right. Audio. Yeah, see, there you go. Here's to getting lucky. <laughs> so, yeah, that I have to unwrap it, right? So, um, Flask will automatically un um, encode it. So it's it's encode URI'd, URI encoded, I should say. <laughs> um, and so it'll automatically unwrap that. But it, this is still just a string in. Um, in Flask. So if I wanted to get that as an actual object, I would need to say json.loads uh, request.args d. Okay, and this is going to be my metrics object. And of course, that could be unsafe because I'm doing, I don't know that that's valid data. So let's. Let's hold that for a second. Let's just let's let's write the negative. Oh, you know what? It throws a value error. It's a JSON decode error, but um, it's a type of value error. So I can I can do this and say accept value error and just ignore it because it's just bad metrics data. So we're not worried about that case. And this will come across. And now my metrics data should be metrics object. Okay. And we'll let it stringify that in Python sorts of ways. All right, so I do that. I hit play. Yeah, now I can see that the, the quoting changed. So this is actually now a, an object. There you go. All right, so now we're collecting a real user metric. Now, let's see what that looks like. This was nice because I only had to wait 61 milliseconds when I ran it on my unshaped internet because the download probably hit the cache and everything was really fast and wonderful. Except we already learned the real internet doesn't work that way. So let's go back to, let's start off in Hong Kong with HKBN, Nick's people. Um, and let's reload so that we get the version that has the metrics in it. All right, great, it loaded, that's cool. So I go and I hit play. I hit play, <laughs> I get to wait. Okay, cool. I go and I hit play and then, yeah, that's that was 8.3 seconds. So we got unlucky with the um, packet loss that time and it stalled the connection. So in this case, yeah, it was 8.3 seconds. So now I'm collecting the real metrics data. Look at that, see, we can get telemetry. Once we know what it's doing, we can start optimizing it because now we're not guessing anymore, right? I can try this in different parts of the world. I can go over to Wahoo. And I can run that again. And this time my metrics blob, oh, let me let me just reload the app so that we know we're fresh. So let me try that again. We can watch it download because we're actually on the client at this point. But when we deploy our production application, we actually get back some telemetry now that we know that we can optimize. We can say 7.1 seconds, that's too long for our users to wait. It's not a good streaming experience. We want it to happen fast. We need it to happen fast. Oh, I've had coffee now. Uh, oh, and sorry, Fafi. Uh, so are you using Flask for the API framework in Python? Yes, I am using Flask. We're using the development server right now. I have it set up with UWSGI um, behind Nginx. Uh, that, that's for kind of bigger apps. I, I'm not really too concerned. I mean, you could write this in Node. It, it wouldn't change it too much. I, I like Python mainly just because it's less lines and I think it translates better to to people that are <laughs> uh, may or may not be familiar with various server tech. Like I don't want to get into like a Java app. We'll we'll spend like the whole episode just setting up our classes and <laughs> whatnot to get anywhere near JSON parsing in Java. Oh, <laughs> that's that's fun. Okay, 
we have a metric, we can optimize it. So what are we gonna do? Well, there's a, there's a whole world in science to optimization, but the first key to any optimization is find out what's really happening before you start optimizing. Now, we could take all of this metrics data, collect it along with the IP for where it's coming from, uh, and, and start building a map. If we collect all of that data and start shaping it by ASN as a, collect a collection of routers, then what we can do, because we can assume that networks are relatively consistent across an ASN, that's not 100% true. There's, there's a few global multinational ASNs that are very much inconsistent across, it depends very much where you are. Uh, but a lot of the smaller ISPs, especially the ones that are much more regionally um, uh, contained, they tend to have fairly consistent network engineering. Uh, you can watch my whole Monitorama talk about that if you're really interested. But um, that's actually where this shaping data comes from. Um, I added this shaping data to the Netflix application. So smart TVs and, uh, let's see, smart TVs, smartphones, there's a web version of it. And uh, oh, I didn't finish deploying that. Sorry, Bogdan. <laughs> um, those are feeding this data. We have iOS data that's in here. So we're seeing mobile networks. We're seeing broadband networks. We're seeing Wi-Fi. We're seeing wired. We're seeing all the different variations. And, we, and when we take all of that data, do a lot of modeling, then we produce this data pack, which gives you a pretty good idea of what things are like. Um, that's a continual process. We need to kind of keep getting better at that. But um, right now, that's pretty much like, this is kind of like how it began. I, I basically collect a ton of this application metric stuff. There's really more on the network side, you know, on, on how long do different network flows take. So that's like, if I do each of these fetches, how long do those fetches take so that I can build a pretty good network model of what the internet looks like. Well, great. I'm going to tell you right now, I think the best thing to do. So there's a lot of ways to optimize this. We're going to optimize it the way a lot of streaming services like to optimize it, which is I told you in an earlier episode that we have an, this was, I was quoting uh, Anthony Park, that there's sort of an iron triangle to streaming. And those variables are really important. They're, they're, it's a constant trade that we always get to make. So in this case, we're keeping full quality, but we're making the user wait. That's not good. Now we're not getting into the rebuffer situation because I haven't done like multiple segments. I'll, maybe I'll do some code for that before another stream, but um, that's where we would just play one after the other because if it stops in the middle, that's a rebuffer, right? That's bad. Then you start showing the spinner while we're loading the next chunk. That's, that's really bad. Netflix tunes that way out. So for right now, we're really only going to worry about quality and speed. And we saw speed and we don't like it. Waiting eight seconds for a video to start is not good. <laughs> so we we want that to not happen. And so the first thing we can do, I mean, we can start preloading. I mean, there's all the different programming tricks that you can use to, to optimize. You can read about performance stuff. Um, but the simplest one to do is we have to send all of this data to start playing. This is 18 megs of data. So we can improve our encoding. We can, we can compress further. That's... There's a lot of techniques available to that if you, you watch the compression episode. Um, so that's one area we could do. We can't do that very quickly. Very quickly, we can have the resolution and scale it up. So this is 240p, and I mentioned we would do this in an earlier episode. I actually checked this in for you. So if you look at the encoding tool, the encoding tool got an edit, which now basically says, scale. So before it was always running it at whatever encode you gave it. So if you gave it a 240 line, you know, if there are 240 progressive lines in your video, then it encoded 240 progressive lines. Well, now it accepts a scale parameter and that's, it was relatively easy to implement, but I think the details aren't that interesting. Basically, I just resized all the images. So if you take all the images that are 240 and you keep the same aspect ratio and you have them, you get 120. And now that I've encoded that for you, which we could, but it was re-encoded if you want to see. I, I don't think that's really that much fun, but um, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll just do it real quick so that you can see what it looks like. So um, I, I included this um, in the previous stream. So we basically, I'm just gonna use the same virtual environment. Uh, this is um, Python. 
and I'm gonna run my encoding script. All right, it's already encoded, so <laughs> it's not gonna tell you very much. If I, if I come over here and I delete my CDN, now it's not encoded. <laughs> then I can go back here, rerun the encoding. And what it did was it unwrapped every one of the frames in the video. So if we were doing like 30 frames a second, there's 30 of these frames every second. And since I'm using these clips, then it, there's 900 frames in a particular clip. That's, yeah, 30 seconds. So it's doing each movie one at a time and it's encoding it at 240p. And then when it's done, it's gonna re-encode all of it at 120p. And if you do all that and you deploy it to your CDN, see, this yeah, takes a little time to encode so we can, we can watch it encode. <laughs> Yeah, and while it's encoding, I can go take a look at chat. Fafi says, I haven't used Flask. We use EF at work in production and Node.js for POFs. Is that like proof of feature, I'm guessing? And early dev since we use Angular in the front end. So I'm only I'm only used to using Node and EF for APIs. Okay, yeah, that, that's totally fair. I mean, it this doesn't change much if you're using Node. Um, I mean, obviously you're gonna be writing in JavaScript as opposed to Python, but I mean, the code is not that different. I mean, like if you're using something like Express and you have routes, you know, you can define exactly the same kind of thing like like I'm doing. Maybe if it really helps, I mean, I could do some of this in, in JavaScript in a future stream. <laughs> but um, the Python I'm really using for compactness because it's a lot easier to express an idea in Python, I think, um, than it is to do it. JavaScript seems to be a lot more lines <laughs> it's easier to get lost as you're doing it um so yeah uh i run i run all that i re-encode all my movies now this by the way you can imagine when i'm only doing six 30 second clips now obviously i didn't optimize the encoder because i just did it quick for the show um and we didn't we can work on optimizing our packing format you know so we can stop storing in json maybe we could do binary serialization there's there's all sorts of different things we can do to optimize it. We, we, we pick a strategy, but the thing is keep the ground truth in mind, right? What are we optimizing? We're optimizing, start with the metric. We're optimizing this metric. So if I'm gonna compress more, that means less bits going, it's probably gonna load faster. I can see how I did based on this metric. Don't guess. <laughs> I am proof of feature concept. I'm the only one. Yeah, it's, I don't know. People are not very talkative today. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking a lot. There's a lot of material to get through. I apologize for that. Um, I realized last week when I was going to originally do this, I was like, wow, this is, this is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, great. We just re-encoded all of our stuff. I could take that, copy it over to the CDN. I already did that for you. Um, and included in there, if I look in the media and this version is these 120p and there you go so now here's all of the movies available in 120p and they're also available in 240p that was a very easy optimization because all I had to do it was really like one line I mean aside from some of the machinery to be able to pass the scale through to all these different functions all it is is really just this. It's an image resize. And I just keep the same width times a scale factor, same height times the same scale factor, anti-alias the result, send it back. And, and that's how I modified these routines. So they're very, very simple. So this pretty much no ops in the event that it's saying keep the same size. It just doesn't do any of the math. But in the case of like the 120, all it did was it took the picture and shrunk it. And then it re-encoded it exactly the same. I had a quick bug fix. I realized where I was off on one of the parameters in the player. But now that I have that, let's see what happens. So here I have my metrics. Now my last metric was from here and it was, it took us 6.7 seconds to get this 18 meg file. Yeah, there, there goes the 18 megs. Now I'm getting lucky, there's not a lot of packet loss. Okay, there you go. So that was a little bit slower that time. Again, the loss is really what, what changes this. But um, so it was about seven seconds. Yeah, and that's, by the time I'm drawing on the screen, 7.4 seconds. Okay, let's do it with the 120p file. 
Look at that. Look at that. 1. 1. 1.8 seconds. So trading quality is a big deal. And if you're wondering why a lot of streaming services start off in lower quality and then they move up, that's why. Now, what I did in the app, you'll notice these pictures are smaller. This is the decode. I kept exactly the same decoding logic. Um, but I added this window. And what I'm doing here is I'm just scaling it. So I, I ran into this problem when we were you know, first doing it in the episode. But basically, I used a hack workaround. I basically just capture the canvas as an image, data URL, and I scale it up. Now, that's something you would do in the video hardware. There's better ways to do this. I could actually do it in the bit. But now I have a metric I can work with. <laughs> and that thing loaded quick on exactly the same internet we went from like seven seconds to one and a half seconds and what does that look like when i start checking around the world that makes a big big difference okay so if i come here to telefonica like i was doing now let's let's go back to telefonica in spain and i just want to add that as a favorite so um so when that change okay this particular thing, you know, here's Telefonica in Spain, we're at a much lower uh, bit rate. So we come here, we reload the page. Now we're using half the resolution, hit play. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, still slow, but you can see that it has a lot less data to transfer. So it's going to get through this and it's going to go, great, start. So. And then we can look at the metrics data that's coming back. Now, again, this is why you want to know which ISP this came from, because the connectivity is going to be, you know, different for different parts of the world. <laughs> so, yeah, totally agree, Fafi. It would be a little awkward if I wasn't talking on my stream. <laughs> okay, so this this is cool. This works. Um, that's That's magic. We can see how this changes now basically we can travel everywhere and we can see what it does um, for different optimizations that we could work on so obviously it's blurrier i don't know how that's coming through on the stream uh you know what's not coming through at all because i've got chromium covering it up <laughs> oh guy <laughs> so um yeah this is it basically loading um this was the window i was looking at and when it came back and it finished, this is a little bit blurrier. You can see on this 120p version that, um, yeah, this wasn't this wasn't as much fun. Uh, it, it was it was a better experience, but we're still not quite there for a product release if we want to get those users. And again, the more ISPs that we can get this to work for, that's more that our product works for around the world. It's more potential customers. That's a big deal. Um, you're. This is going to come up in your career. <laughs> so, yeah, in HKBN, it started pretty fast. I got my play start down to 266 milliseconds. <laughs> that was a sorry. That was the wrong one. No, this was. Um, let me let me let me clear that. That was that was from before. So we're going to go back to recording. Um, I actually did get the metric up here, but it was 1.7 seconds on that start. So if I reload, I know I've got my cache disabled, and I hit play. This is kind of the number we care about. It downloads this thing, and that's it. We got our metrics response. Stop this. Four seconds. If I change to um, the 240 version, we saw before it was about seven seconds. So if I come here and I say this, let's do this at 240. And I'll just clear our log here, clear all this. We're good to go. We hit play. Yeah, so obviously the quality is going to be better, but the user has to wait longer. It's not it's not as crisp and quick an experience. So, and that's something where we could get really advanced over time. Now that we can kind of really see what it's like for the user, this is something you could. The hardest part I think of of solving any of these internet issues is just knowing what the internet looks like and knowing being able to be in Hong Kong or Brazil or anywhere around the world and experience the what that's like. It's very easy to optimize the target when you kind of know how the target works. <laughs> like, as you can see, I can do my coding changes here and I can Im get immediate feedback and then I can confirm it with actual data from the field, right? This is, this all kind of works. So um, that's the big topic.
let me let me know if any of that is sort of confusing. Um, so when we have all that um, done, you know, where can we go in the future? This obviously um, there's a lot that we can do here. So we can uh, we can start working. I mean, a real a real streaming service is going to adaptively switch between these different quality factors depending on your internet. So we could put some logic in here, but like, okay, the internet's downloading pretty. I don't know. I don't have any previous data. Just take the lowest quality one, start as quick as possible, collect some data, keep some history, up, upgrade based on what the connection will support. See how often, you know, how long does the page take to load? I could add another metric. I could, I could say, what's the time to interactive? What's the time to being responsive? When, when, when is it that the user gets a, a chance? Which metric do I want to optimize? Um, I can do better job. I can do a better job compressing. Right? You know, how much is binary serialization worth? Well, it'll shave, you know, half the fifty percent savings in terms of what I'm transmitting over the wire. That's a big deal. <laughs> I can. This application is going to work a lot better. It's going to be a lot more responsive. I could start at a higher quality level. Um, if I'm working on a general application, I I can get a real sense of what how it works for my users you know what's it like over a cell provider you know like like what if i go and i hook this thing up to like well, i don't have t-mobile loaded here but um let me uh yeah let's just pick a cell provider yeah i mean we could again you'd want to see what um particular uh ip you're getting so I, i'd want to take a look at like you know like at&t or something um but i I can actually test it exactly as it is kind of out in the field. And that's that's what's sort of amazing about this immediate feedback. It makes optimization, because there's all these, I mean, as a programmer, you're always kind of guessing. You're like, what, what? I don't know, I think this is better. This is less bits, so it should be better. Sometimes the data doesn't agree. Sometimes you don't have any data. <laughs> so that's where you really want to collect this. Um, let me tell you, that's a much better argument when you're at work and you're like, look, I can prove that this one is significantly better than the other. And that's one of the things I really liked when I was at Netflix is that a lot of it is data driven. So the decisions usually are like, okay, show me a metric that tangibly improves, that builds a better experience. I can break this into smaller chunks. Right now I'm using 30 second chunks. I could use two second chunks and have a lot more room to switch up and down quality. As you saw, I can rescale it. That's kind of how I get the, the difference in, you know, smudginess in the video. Um, or I could play around with like the search, you know, when I was back here on the application, this, well, actually it was quite a ways, a little, a little bit ago. Um, I could see how fast it is from when the user hits a key to when it renders. Uh, that would be a really useful metric if I was trying to, if, if I know that this is the primary thing a user is doing in my application is searching for some content. Um, I could see like how fast do the keys respond, you know. I mean, again, that's it's really fast here because there's not much in this app yet. But <laughs> that's 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 sort of like you know this is real world software engineering. So anyway, uh, there's a lot you can do. Hey, Ethrix, how are you doing? I haven't seen you in a few streams. Um, Fafi says we do static images with dynamic overlays at work. If it takes 15 seconds for the overlay to appear on the image custom text or image on a shirt our customers have a bad UX and they will send complaints. Yeah, I mean, this is a really easy way to see what's really happening for your customers. Um, yeah, th there's a lot of different tricks. Like for example, I have in here, I've got the text of the search result and I have the, uh, the frame of the search result. I might run an AB test, which there's an AB episode coming up, um, where I want to know like, is it better to show just the text even if the image hasn't loaded or just wait until the image loads because the image is much richer to the user experience so that matters more? How do you make that kind of trade? Well, the easy way to do it is measure the metrics that matter, you know, I mean that that could be the hard part, but um, you know, it's not too hard to add these metrics. So add them in, start looking, and then test the stuff, you know, like you can run an actual A-B test and say like, okay, this improves the load time, but users tend to abandon more, you know, I mean, if, if you're doing like a sign up funnel or if you're doing a, um, you know, a campaign like, a, a, you know, conversions for marketing, like say you're selling an online product. I don't know what kind of product you're working on, Fafi, but 
I mean, you, you have you you really want to have these metrics built around some particular goal. Like, is it how much people stream? Is it how much they look through the cattle? I mean, what what are you trying to optimize? Then figure out what you can measure. Then figure out like you know how you can actually see what it's like from their shoes. And that's that's what this is. This will help you a lot with that. Um, I will tell you this. I mean, there's like a world of engineering questions. I will tell you this. This is available now. I, I worked I worked on this for a while. Um, and if you wanted to use it, I, I don't suggest you download it right now. There's there's some, <laughs> it's it's still pretty alpha. I mean, the you're seeing it work here, but I know that there's some data pack problems uh, in the most recent data set. So we're, we're, we're going to need to do a little bit more work there. But um, this is available at uh, menos.org. So this is, um, I, I called it Mana OS because it powers a device that I lovingly named the Magic Modem after Torio's suggestion, uh, which uh, is really a router, but it has a modem built in. <laughs> Some fun there. But uh, this, you don't need to use the hardware to use this. The VirtualBox version is available. A little bit rough. Give me, give me till next week. But um, just in case, like this is the link. You can check out this beautiful website. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, built. Uh, so this is, um, yeah, and you can read about it and use it if you want. Um, like I said, it does work in VirtualBox, or you can put it on actual hardware. I don't support that much hardware yet, but um, the data is the data is interesting. Um, it has the whole story about how when I was sitting in this is in Kazakhstan testing. Netflix, which was sort of a fun <laughs> time. The way I got this to work ultimately kind of came down to using a lot of these techniques. And it's really about knowing which bits you can use, which you can sacrifice. Where does the quality matter? Where's the quality hurt? Where does it, you know, where's it better to start fast? And that's, that's kind of the real world of trades in engineering. So uh, that's kind of it. That's episode five. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you all have a good time with your other engineering activities. It's very hard. <laughs> it's a hard field. Let's um, yeah, let's let's find somebody to raid. So, uh, if you want to check it out, so next week I'm gonna be going back. This is the uh, uh, let's see. This is. Uh, CSG Flix. This was CSG Flix. Yeah, this was the uh, kind of the real internet. This is where most companies tend to go wrong with their products. So um, here's a tool that'll help you with it. Um, and by the way, I'm going to show the right screen for that. This is um, this is cool. I'm not sure we're going to do personalization. I might I might do more on the. Uh, the, the application side. Maybe we'll do chunks. I mean, we could do either adaptive streaming or personalization. Uh, it'll, we'll see. Uh, let me let me see what I can kind of pull together for for next week's show. Um, I, I think here for episode seven, definitely going to do A B tests. So if you're interested in that, and those are kind of the lot, and then you know we'll be around to chat and talk about our new streaming product and how it works all around the world because we have this wonderful globe, which I think I'm going to add to the magic modem now that it. It can do these things and you know we can we can travel to Brazil or we can travel to Argentina or we can travel to Iceland <laughs> so I think it'll be fun that might be a fun little visualization to throw into the magic modem so I'll get to that uh, some point in the future 